when we think about how our periodic table is arranged, the elements aren't just thrown up on the wall in any which order. There's a rhyme and reason to the location of each individual element. If we look going from left to right across the rows, you'll notice that the atomic number increases by one each time. That means we're adding one more proton to the middle of the nucleus. And when it's neutral, we also get one more electron in the electron cloud. So they're organized horizontally by the number of protons that are in the nucleus. But if that's all that was true, we could just put them in one long line instead of in the table format that we currently have. The elements are arranged in columns by how many valence electrons are in the outermost energy level. So everything in the first column has one valence electron, everything in the second column has two, etc. So whenever you arrange them due to that characteristic, you're going to observe some other trends in the elements as you go across the table, up and down the table, things like that. So there's the atomic mass or the atomic weight. Typically, you'll see an increase from element to element as you go across the rows. You add more particles, you're going to get a greater mass. There are few where it doesn't quite work. If you look at numbers 52, 53, and 54 in the bottom right-hand corner, tellurium has a mass of 127.6 but iodine has a mass of 126.9. It gets smaller, and then xenon is back up at 131. So ever so often, there will be an element that doesn't quite follow the trend. So the trends we're going to be looking at today are all general trends. For the most part, they'll exhibit these properties. And as we talk through the three different types of trends we're going to observe, we're going to focus on a certain element. We are going to focus on fluorine. If you've ever seen the movie Rudy, Rudy was small, little, but strong, very persistent. So fluorine is going to be our Rudy of the periodic table. It's going to have a small size, but a lot of energy. So the first thing we're looking at is the atomic radius. Radius, remember, is going to be from the distance of a circle out to the edge. So in an atom, it's going to be from the center of the nucleus out to the edge of the electron cloud. And if we think about what's happening as we go left to right on our periodic table, we might think that as we go from one element to the next, and we're going across here, that the elements would be getting larger because you get a new proton and a new electron each time you move across. They are getting more massive. It is gaining weight each time. But if we think about what charges protons and electrons have, protons have a positive charge, and they're in the nucleus, while the electron out here has a negative charge. So if I add another positive proton and another negative electron, there's going to be a greater force of attraction between those opposite charges. Remember, opposites attract. So the positives here in the middle are pulling on those negative electrons a little bit more than they were before, and it's going to be pulled in just a little bit. You add another proton and another electron, it's going to be pulled in even more. You add another, you add another, and we see an even greater increase in that force of attraction. So each time you add those particles, you're going to see a slight, a slighter increase in the attraction, and it's going to pull in just a little bit more. So as we go across our periodic table, our elements are getting smaller in terms of their atomic radius. So atomic radius decreases as you move across, and each time you go one row further down on the table, you're introducing a new energy level around the outside of that atom. So every time you travel down a row on the table, you're going to see an increase in size. So it increases as you move down. So if we're just going to use arrows to show how things are increasing, the size increases as we go down, and it also will increase as we move back to the left. Because we said it's going to I might have said that wrong. It's going to increase in size. This is going to be the biggest over here. This is going to be the smallest up here. So on our table that we have on the next page, we're going to go ahead and fill in that trend. We'll see an increase. This is going to be an increase in the atomic radius going back to the left. And also down the table. And if we're focusing on fluorine as being the small, mighty one, 
then it's going to have a small atomic radius. The noble gases don't really follow the trends very well that we're looking at, so we're going to cross those off. And then another element that really doesn't fit in where it is positioned in some ways will be hydrogen. So we'll cross them off too. Okay. So if we want to look at a couple of elements and find out which one is going to have the greater or smaller radius size, we're going to have to take a look at their position on the table. So we want to look at the elements chlorine and sulfur, and we want to find the one that has the larger atomic radius. So when we look at our periodic table, I've got chlorine and sulfur that we're comparing. Chlorine's right here, sulfur's right here. So if we want the larger one, we see an increase in our radius as we go to the left. So that means that the one further left, in this case sulfur, will be the one with the larger radius. You can also think about it in terms of where's its position related to fluorine. Fluorine's the smallest, so sulfur's a little bit further away, it'll be bigger. The next two we're comparing are chlorine and bromine. So bromine will be right here below chlorine. So if we want the larger radius, it's the one further down. It increases as we travel down the table. So we're going to have bromine as the one with the larger radius. Oh, wrong way. Again, both of these are larger because they're far from fluorine. So if we look at our table, we kind of think about, well, what's going to be the largest one then? If fluorine up here is the smallest, then, and it increases going back to the left and down the table, then in our bottom left-hand corner down here, we have francium, and it's going to have a large atomic radius. Okay. The next trend we're going to address is going to be ionization energy. And if you just take the first three letters there and think about what an ion is, an ion is a charged atom, it's either positive or negative, and it took on that charge because it either gained or lost electrons. So basically, you can think of the ionization energy is how much energy it's going to take to make it be an ion, and it's the amount of energy specifically required to remove an electron. So if you think about the different elements that are on the table, we think about fluorine. It's in group 7A, so it has seven valence electrons. Its goal is to get a full octet of eight electrons. So there are two different ways it can do that. It can get rid of the seven it already has so that that energy level goes away entirely, or it could gain one more to fill the current energy level. And the easiest thing would be just to gain one more. So we're looking at how much energy it would take to remove an electron from that fluorine. Fluorine doesn't want to give up any of its electrons. It wants one more, so it's going to hold on to the seven it already has with all it's got. It's not going to want to give up an electron to any other element. So the ionization energy will be the greatest in fluorine, and then we'll see a general trend where it will get smaller as you move away from it. So our general trend is that ionization energy increases as we move across the table, closer to fluorine, and it's going to decrease as we move down the table, as we move away from fluorine. So we're seeing that it gets larger the closer to fluorine we get. So on our periodic table on the next page, we can fill in that trend here. And this is the first ionization energy, the energy required to pull off that first electron. And we see the general trend to the right and up the table. There are other ionization energies if we wanted to pull off a second electron from the atom, we could have a second ionization energy, etc. Now let's talk about this very first column. These are our alkali metals here, and remember they're in group 1A, so that means they have one valence electron. So let's think about lithium real quick, sitting right here. If it has a charge of plus one, because it's going to, sorry, it's in group 1A, so it's going to have one valence electron. And if we want to steal that electron, 
it's going to be very accommodating. It's It wants to get rid of that one electron. So it's not going to hold on with that extra electron with much energy. It's going to have a very low ionization energy. Another atom could come along and say, hey, I want that electron. And lithium's like, okay, here you go. Without much effort, you can have it. So that's why those in the very first column have low, very low ionization energies, because they actually want to get rid of that electron. They're not trying to get any more of them. Okay. So we want to compare some elements. We've got oxygen and nitrogen. So let's look at where they are on the table. We've got oxygen here next to fluorine and nitrogen next to that. So between those two, if I want the one that has the larger ionization energy, you can think about the fact that the trend increases as you move to the right. So oxygen's further to the right. It'll have the higher value. Or you can think about it in terms of fluorine. Fluorine's the highest. Which one is closer to fluorine? It's going to be oxygen. So then the next one wants us to compare oxygen and sulfur. Our trend we saw is increasing as we travel up the table. So that means that the one that's above oxygen would be greater. So oxygen was the answer on both of those. The last trend has similar reasoning as the ionization energy one. It's called electronegativity. And instead of talking about how much it wants to hold on to the electrons it already has, we're talking about how much an atom wants to go and take electrons from a different atom. It's an attraction an atom has for electrons that are already bonded to a different atom. So when we talk about fluorine with its seven valence electrons, it wants to have eight. It needs just one more. So it has a very strong drive to go and try to take electrons from a different atom to try to overcome a different atom's ionization energy. But something like sodium or lithium or potassium in that first column, they have one electron that they want to get rid of. They're not going to go and try to take electrons from other atoms. So they have very low electronegativity values. This is the exact same trend that we saw for ionization energy. It increases as we move across. Fluorine will be the highest on the right and then it's going to decrease as you move down the table. Because you're getting an additional energy level each time, and the distance between the nucleus and those electrons on the outside gets larger, and so there's not quite as much attraction between them, and it's going to be easier for those electrons to be pulled off. So that's why there's that general decrease in that electronegativity as you move down the table. So we can fill in this trend on our chart. Electronegativity will increase moving to the right and these are just arbitrary values that were assigned for was assigned to be the highest for fluorine and then the others were determined in relation to fluorine and given values and on the last page in this note packet you actually have a table that gives the electronegativity values for the different elements that we're going to be able to use to determine um, polarity for different bonds that form in different compounds and figure out if the entire thing will be an ionic bond, a covalent bond, what type of covalent bond, things like that. So our fluorine up here at the top, in addition to having a small atomic radius, is going to have high ionization energy and it's going to have high electronegativity. It is the Rudy of the table, small but mighty, small but strong. Over here with francium, Remember, it was large in size. It's going to have a low ionization energy because it wants to get rid of its electron. And it's also going to have low electronegativity. It has no desire to go get any other electrons. Now, here in the middle, we have not really talked about these yet. We know that there's a line that divides our periodic table into two sections. And we see that come in right here. We have our staircase that separates our metals from our nonmetals, and right along the staircase we have our metalloids. I actually started in the wrong spot. No, that's where I started it. We're good. What we want to do is fill in these arrows with the fact that as you travel down to this bottom left-hand corner, we're going to see an increase in metallic character. And as we travel to the right, we're going to see an increase in non-metallic character. 
We've split the table into three sections. We've said these are metals, these are nonmetals, these are metalloids. But even within those sections, you can have different degrees. You can have things that are a lot more metal-like and some metals that are only just kind of metal-like. Um, some characteristics of metals is that they have luster, which means they're shiny. Some are going to be more shiny than others. They're good conductors of heat and electricity. We know that some metals are better used for conducting for that transmission of electricity than others. Um, being ductile, being malleable, being able to shape them without them breaking. Some of them are able to withstand that a lot more than others. And then we also see the opposite trend for our non-metallic character. They're becoming more dull. They're becoming more insulating, things of that nature. So we still had a couple of elements to compare for the electronegativity values. Both of these down here should ask for the electronegativity, which one is larger. So when we look at our periodic table, we've got fluorine over here on this side, and we want to find magnesium and sodium. They're side by side over on the left-hand side, and we want to know which one of these two would have the larger electronegativity. We saw our trend increasing as we went across. So as we go across there, this one will be larger. Well, now we want to compare potassium and sodium. Potassium's right here. So we're seeing a trend where it decreases as you move down the table, which means it's increasing as you move up. Same trend that we saw up here. So that means that the one with the higher value will be sodium. You can also think about it in terms of fluorine. Which one is closer? Going across, magnesium is closer. When you think up and down with just those two, if that's not in the picture, then sodium will be closer. For your assignment, you're going to be looking at a form on Google Forms. You can access it by either typing this in. It's goo.gl, like Google, without the E and with a dot there inside. And you have to match the caps on this. So if it's lowercase, like that Q has to be lowercase. Everything else there at the end has to be capitalized. Or you can scan the QR code. Or I'll put a link um, in the description below where you can click. But whenever you go there, you're going to have something that looks kind of like this. Just like we were practicing, you're going to have two elements and you have to pick what it says. So if this is asking for the largest atomic radius between phosphorus and chlorine. We go and we look at our table. We've got fluorine here, chlorine's below it, then we've got sulfur and phosphorus. So if we're comparing this one and this one. We want the one that's larger. Fluorine is small in size, so the biggest one is farther away. We know our trend is that it gets larger going across, so phosphorus would have the larger one. And you would just choose that from the list. And you just go through like we've been working. You do have some retro questions listed at the bottom. When it asks for how many electrons these have, that's going to be how many total electrons. So whenever you look at the periodic table, if we look up calcium, calcium is number 20, which means that when it's neutral, when it has no charge, you're going to have 20 electrons. So if it has a charge of 2+, plus, you need to think about, does that mean that I lost 2 electrons or that I gained 2 electrons? And then that would be the number that you would write down once you've either added two or taken two away. And you'll do the same thing for the chlorine ion. Just realize there that whenever it says Cl minus, that minus means it has a charge of negative one. 